climactic eruption of the Philippines' Mount Pinatubo on June 15, 1991, is a jolting reminder that the world is riddled with dangerous volcanoes. The blast propelled volcanic ash 22 miles high. It killed more than 700 people. Many, when wet ash, collapsed roofs. Massive mud flows took still more lives. It also triggered memories of far more devastating eruptions in the past. Like Tambora in 1815, Krakatoa in 1883, and Mount Pele in 1902. But Pinatubo is far from the most dangerous volcano in the world today. Many volcanologists say it's Italy's Mount Vesuvius. Its last devastating eruption was in AD 79, which obliterated the cities of Pompeii and Herculaneum. Today, Naples and its surrounding communities, population three million, sit on Vesuvius's front porch. Geologic evidence suggests it's primed for a repeat. But what is the most dangerous volcano in the United States? You might think it's the most active. That's Kilauea on Hawaii's Big Island. It's been erupting continuously for more than two decades. But its large lava flows, which have sporadically threatened small communities, move slowly, leaving plenty of time to evacuate. So Kilauea is not the most dangerous. Scientists agree the most dangerous U.S. volcano is within the North American edge of the so-called Ring of Fire. Stretching from Northern California to Northern Washington, 13 volcanoes are considered highly dangerous. One of them unleashed a blast forever burned in the American consciousness. In March 1980, Mount St. Helens collapsed in the largest landslide in recorded human history. Huge wall of rock came rushing down off the volcano, slammed into Johnson Ridge, bounced off it, and traveled 14 miles down the Tootle River Valley, filling it to an average depth of 150 feet. And if we had been standing right here watching this explosion, we would have had 43 seconds to live. Get up! The eruption killed 57 people and devastated hundreds of square miles of forest land. Mount St. Helens is still an active volcano, but it's not the most dangerous. America's most dangerous volcano is a mere 50 miles to the north. It's Mount Rainier, a 14,400-foot peak looming over Seattle and Tacoma the most densely populated region in the Pacific Northwest. The volcano hasn't erupted in over 150 years, but its frequent tremors serve notice that it's geologically alive and kicking. It's an active volcano. That's the first thing I want to stress. Many people believe it, it isn't, but it is indeed a very active volcano. Surprisingly, it's not an eruption of searing lava and ash that scientists fear most but a terrifying phenomenon that an eruption could trigger. In the 1950s, geologist Rocky Crandall found the evidence in fossilized mud deposits along Rainier's watershed valleys. It's called lahar, an Indonesian word meaning volcanic mud flow. This was the devastating phenomenon that occurred when Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980. And it last happened on Rainier just 500 years ago. Rainier's past lahar swiftly buried many square miles in up to 30 feet of mud. This same region today is home to approximately 100,000 people in communities neighboring Seattle and Tacoma. The potential for another massive lahar is lurking in Rainier's snowy cap. The volcano contains approximately one cubic mile of glacial ice as much as exists on the other 12 Cascades volcanoes combined. An earthquake, heavy rainfall, or even gravity's pull could trigger a lahar. But most begin when hot rocks from an eruption melt snow and ice. The meltwater picks up loose rock and creates a slurry of mud and boulders, 
reaching speeds of up to 70 miles per hour. It could be just an unheralded collapse where the mountain just gives way. Weak mountain, lots of soil, starts washing down the Puyallup River Valley, picks up more and more trees, gets bigger and bigger as it goes, uh, lots of liquid. It's probably moving 60 to 70 miles per hour in the upper valley here. Just 30 miles from Mount Rainier, the most endangered are the 5,500 residents of the city of Porting. They would have less than 40 minutes before the deluge is upon them. And it takes them close to that amount of time to get all the kids out of their school and out of the valley. I think it would be difficult, actually, to get everyone out of there. I mean, certainly the hope is that we could. Fleeing motorists would clog the few exit roads out of the valley, causing gridlock. Lahar drills teach residents to run immediately for high ground to escape the unrelenting flow. The brutal scenario's long-term impacts are sobering. A Mount Rainier event would not just be a Pierce County event. It would be truly a regional event, a, a statewide event. Potentially thousands dead. Major shipping ports in Tacoma and Seattle paralyzed. Transportation routes and airports shut down. A large lahar could dwarf the human and economic toll of Hurricane Katrina. So we're not just looking at a temporary displacement. It could be a complete relocation effort. And economically, it's, it's going to have a huge impact. Some Washington residents doubt this grim scenario will ever happen. But their reality check lies in the tragedy triggered by Colombia's Nevado del Ruiz volcano in 1985, which, like Rainier, has a large ice cap. Several hours after a small eruption, a lahar charged down and slammed into the city of Armero with several feet of mud similar to wet concrete. More than 23,000 people perished. And it's estimated that uh, if those people in Armero had had any type of early warning, they could have comfortably walked to safety. It was a matter of getting to high ground. That was our learning moment. In the late 1990s, U.S. Geological Survey scientists built a Lahar early warning and detection system for Mount Rainier. The system depends on 10 remotely located acoustic flow monitors, or AFMs, basically electronic ears listening for signs of a Lahar. This AFM site uh, that sits up higher here, it's designed to stay intact for a mud flow. It's got a radio inside of it. Every nine minutes it transmits, and we receive that at a computer down at our base station. It's got the antenna there and the solar panels, batteries inside of it, so it's totally self-contained. When it detects a lahar, the station will increase transmissions to every three minutes to emergency responders and 911 centers. The chances that an AFM will cry wolf are nil. The challenge was a lot of lahars are generated during eruptions of volcanoes. So there's earthquakes, there's explosions, um, tremor. So we had to have a very focused sensor, one that was sensitive to lahars, but not to all the other goings on. Each AFM owes its keen sensitivity to an acoustic geophone buried five feet below the ground. The geophone is fine-tuned to ignore low amplitude signatures from tremors. It only responds to the distinct high amplitude signature of a lahar and triggers the warning signal. Three of the 10 AFM stations are designed as fail-safe alarms. They were intentionally placed low in the valley, directly in the path of a future lahar. What we've got here is our, uh, this is what we call one of our dead man sites. This log here is designed to get washed away if there's a big mud flow or a lahar. And kind of hence the term that, you know, the site's gonna go dead. The log is hardwired to the AFM's transmitter. If the log washes away, the signal goes dead, and emergency responders know what's headed their way. Scientists estimate that in our lifetime, there's about a one in seven chance that a massive lahar sweeps this log up in a torrent that devastates the communities surrounding Rainier. 
But if that one chance plays out, the magnitude of the disaster will no doubt increase as more communities sprout in the Lahar's projected path. While Rainier ranks as the most dangerous volcano today, the ultimate big blow could occur some 500 miles east, hundreds of thousands of years from now. The pristine wilderness and bubbling geysers of Yellowstone National Park offer subtle proof of what slumbers below. An immense 1,300 square mile supervolcano with a magma load estimated at 4,000 cubic miles. Geologic evidence dating back more than two million years proves the giant has erupted at least three times with almost incomprehensible force. It's just on a scale that's really difficult to get your head around because you're talking a uh, you know, thousand times more than 1980 St. Helens. It's going to devastate you know, areas that are going to be tens to hundreds of kilometers around the volcano. If Yellowstone delivers a supersized encore, the final death toll could be in the millions. While some people play the odds, building their dream homes in the shadows of hell's own vents, others gleefully pull on a pair of high boots and chaps to catch America's most dangerous snake. This is the most dangerous snake in the United States the Western Diamondback Rattlesnake. But that doesn't stop Jack Allen. He hunts the Western Diamondback in the hard-bitten lands of West Texas. Its venom toxicity is moderate, but it's quick to anger and inhabits vast areas of the Western United States, meaning more human encounters and more bites. They won't chase you or nothing, but if you go up and try to mess with them, they will bite you. And it and they won't always rattle. You know, they won't rattle before they bite all the time. As dangerous as the Western Diamondback is, the world is full of even more lethal snakes. Take the King Cobra. It's the world's longest venomous snake, and it can deliver a huge dose of venom that's highly toxic, enough to kill an elephant in a single bite. Fortunately, it rarely bites humans. Nor does Australia's inland Taipan. But it has the most toxic venom of any snake on Earth. A single drop could kill you in minutes. Still, it's not the most dangerous because it's a shy, reclusive snake that humans rarely encounter in the wild. The world's most dangerous snake, the saw-scale viper. It's aggressive and inhabits heavily populated areas in Asia and North Africa and kills some 10,000 people every year. The statistics aren't nearly as shocking in the United States. All the same, rattlesnakes bite approximately 6,000 people in the United States each year. About six die. The primary victims? Teenagers who harass or try to catch the snakes. A seasoned hunter like Jack is well aware of the risks. That's why he uses the best tools for the job. These are a set of tongs, snake tongs we call them. This is a hook to hook them. I have on extra double lined leather boots that come up to my knees. These are a set of chaps, they're snake chaps. They protect my legs. You might step off of a, a ledge sometimes and there'll be one under it that you don't see and it's protect me from getting bit. We found a rattlesnake in a hill here, Western Diamondback rattlesnake. We'll try to pull him out of this hole. They swell up sometimes, and you can't get them out very easy. We try to be safe, not hurt the animal. They can swing around and bite you at any time. Most rattlesnake venom is hemotoxic. That means it contains proteins and enzymes that damage tissue and organs while causing great pain. If you want to know what a snake bite feels like, a Hit your finger with a five pound sludge hammer. There's internal hemorrhage, swelling, and it's just very painful. 
if it's a bad enough bite, sometimes the swelling can be so bad that the skin, they'll have to split your skin because it'll start swelling so much, it'll actually start destroying the muscle right. tissue. Let's go ahead and somebody mix the crow fab and start to give it. These scenes from an emergency room demonstrate some extreme side effects, like respiratory failure, involuntary muscle contractions, or anaphylaxis, a rare whole body allergic reaction that can restrict breathing and cause abdominal cramps, vomiting, and extreme swelling. I can't believe that little guy did that. Nobody dies from a rattlesnake bite, but a lot of people go into shock from a rattlesnake bite and die from it. The Western's long, deadly fangs are folded back against the roof of the mouth. When the mouth opens up to nearly 180 degrees, the fangs swing forward. Glands in the back of the head pump venom through the hollow fangs into the prey. If it's your lucky day, you could be the recipient of a dry bite. In about one in four cases, rattlers do not inject any venom. 20 snakes per day. OK, this is a Mojave. It's one of the most toxic venoms that we have in the United States. This uncooperative inmate is the Western Diamondback's big cousin, the Eastern Diamondback. OK, don't worry. Don't worry. Get it from the middle class. The eastern diamondback is the largest of all rattlesnakes. And because of its more frequent attacks on humans, is arguably as dangerous as the western diamondback. Okay, I'm gonna pin head down. The venom is centrifuged to remove cellular debris and then frozen for future research. I think what we're doing here and with other countries is laying groundwork for future generations to discover. You know, some of these species will become extinct. And if we don't capture their genes in a bacteria, we will never be able to use them in drug discovery. Mankind has everything to gain from the venom of the most dangerous snakes. But when it comes to the most dangerous weather event in the United States, we have everything to lose. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. The aftermath of a killer storm tells a brutal truth. In the face of nature's fury, no one is completely safe. What is the most dangerous weather event in the United States? After the devastation wrought by Katrina, the 2005 tragedy that took more than 1,800 lives, the hurricane would seem the likely answer. But hurricanes are infrequent, easily detected, and often arrive with days of forewarning. The random ferocity of lightning ranks high on the danger list. The air around a bolt sizzles at around 30,000 degrees, six times hotter than the sun's surface. Some 60 people a year die when struck by lightning, but it's not the biggest threat. Because of its sudden immense capacity for destruction, the most dangerous weather event in the United States is the tornado. Tornadoes can have extremely high wind speeds, wind speeds as high as 250, 260 miles per hour. They can do tremendous damage to, to structures. They can break houses and buildings apart into small pieces of debris, which can hurt people as they fly around. We really aren't able to give very long lead times on tornadoes that, that tell people that they're coming. They usually only have minutes to respond. The most dangerous tornadoes, rated F2 or higher on the Fujita scale, appear to be random, unpredictable events. And they can appear in droves. The only predictable aspect is the geographic area most frequently hit. America's infamous Tornado Alley extends up the central plains of the United States, where warm, moist air from the Gulf of Mexico meets cold, dry air from the Rocky Mountains. And the presence of those two big geographic factors leads to us bringing the ingredients together for tornadoes here more than any place else on the planet. We got one now, and it's going down. It's on the ground. Over the past half century, 
311 twisters have taken lives in the plains. Fewer tornadoes strike the American Southeast, states like Arkansas, Tennessee, Alabama, and Mississippi. But its residents are in even greater danger. The reason? The Southeast has the greatest concentration of mobile homes in the country. Since they lack foundations, these tornado targets are the most vulnerable shelters. Mobile home residents are 15 to 20 times more likely to be killed in a tornado than permanent home residents are. That's the most dangerous place for human life in tornadoes in the country. The human toll is distressing, but not when you compare it to a worst case scenario that someday might conceivably occur. Perhaps the biggest nightmare scenario is hitting a large sporting venue, say the Texas Motor Speedway in Fort Worth during the NASCAR race in early April, or the Indianapolis Motor Speedway during the 500 at the end of May, when you have hundreds of thousands of people in a small area and in an area where even under the absolute best conditions, it takes three to four hours to actually get everybody out of there. America's most dangerous twister to date occurred on March 18th, 1925. The tri-state tornado traveled 219 miles at over 60 miles per hour through Missouri, Illinois, and Indiana. After three and a half hours, an estimated 695 people were dead and 2,000 injured. Two factors played a huge role in the heavy death toll. The lack of a tornado warning system and inadequate shelter. Thanks to research labs like the Wind Science Center at Texas Tech University, the modern storm shelter is sturdier and more resistant to wind-blown debris. Scientists here built a debris cannon to simulate the effects of a large tornado hurling building materials through the air at lethal speeds. In this case, a 15-pound 2x4 traveling at 100 miles per hour. It takes more than four layers of three-quarter inch plywood to stop this missile. The masonry does a good job provided it's reinforced. But if it's not reinforced, then it, it provides little protection against the impact. So with uh, ordinary construction, a brick veneer house is not safe at all. Studies here have led to the development of life-saving above-ground storm shelters and reinforced safe rooms built directly into home floor plans. But a better shelter is only half the answer. Timely prediction is the key to reducing the carnage. The National Weather Service monitors storm cells around the clock and issues alerts when conditions are favorable for tornadoes. In Norman, Oklahoma, Scientists at the National Severe Storms Lab and the University of Oklahoma unlock the mysteries of tornado dynamics with the 800-pound gorilla of radar systems, the cutting-edge smart mobile Doppler. It allows us to take this Doppler weather radar into hurricanes and tornadic storm environments where we can actually look close and see the very uh, low-level parts of the storm where the most severe weather is occurring. This data is later used to help build tornado computer models. We don't yet completely understand uh, how it is that tornadoes form. We have hypotheses, but they need to be tested. Using a computer model, we can go ahead and change the way the winds vary with height in the atmosphere. We can change the way temperature and humidity vary with height. And we can see how the atmosphere would respond to these different types of conditions. The hope is that one day the National Weather Service can actually predict lethal tornadoes with even greater lead time, saving countless lives. A tornado is undoubtedly a killer force of nature. But statistically, someone in your family is in far greater danger playing the most dangerous team sport. It's a statistical fact that many of America's favorite sports are dangerous. Some 22,000 people are injured every year playing ice hockey. 
Some 120,000 broken bones, torn muscles, and head injuries happen annually on the baseball diamond. The Centers for Disease Control estimates Americans suffer between 1.6 and 3.8 million sports-related concussions every year. The statistical leader in concussive events, and therefore the most dangerous, is football. The physics associated with ever larger, more powerful athletes applying brutal hits can spell disaster for the brain. In professional and college level games, players are sometimes traveling more than 20 miles per hour when helmet impacts occur. You see, this is a brain and it is surrounded by a vault. That vault is the skull. When a concussion occurs, there is movement, movement, acceleration, then sudden deceleration. As the brain decelerates, it impacts against the skull, causing bruising. In severe cases, the brain can actually bounce back and strike the other side of the skull. It's a collision sport, and injuries do happen. And sometimes what happens is it could be the lightest hit that will turn the neck the wrong way, and one of them's down on the ground injured with a concussion. The majority of dangerous concussions occur not among pros, but younger athletes whose brains are still developing. It is particularly dangerous for individuals age 18 and younger because of the related growth and the risk for herniation and edema or swelling that occurs in young brains. The first line of defense is the helmet. 21st century sporting goods manufacturers are racing to build the most advanced protective headgear in history. A history that began more than a century ago. In 1893, a lineman for Navy, Joe Reeves, wore the first crude football helmet in the Army-Navy game, later giving birth to the term leatherheads. The leather headgear offered little protection, and it wasn't until the 1930s that helmets became mandatory. After World War II, plastics revolutionized the game with vastly more protective helmets. Over the past 60 years, Shut Sports in Salem, Illinois, has churned out millions of helmets for pro, college, high school, and even peewee leagues. Their genesis? Millions of polycarbonate resin pellets. When heated to 450 degrees Fahrenheit, the resin melts and injects into a custom helmet mold. After a quick baking and cooling, a precision robotic drill creates all of the ventilation and hardware holes. Lastly, the paint shop mixes and matches thousands of colors before the helmets get to the gridiron. Beneath the glossy hues, Schutt's most advanced helmet is a far cry from the foam padded relics of the past. This is the um, Schutt Ion 4D helmet, and it's our newest helmet in the lineup of um, helmet protection. With the uh, helmet, we have the Skydex padding system, which is a three-dimensional shaped uh, padding system, which fits much closer to the player's head. The Ion 4D's thermoplastic Skydex padding is designed with opposing outer and inner hemispheres. At impact, the hemispheres collapse together and absorb more energy from nasty hits. Beyond that, the Ion's face guard adds more protection over the standard bolt-on cage. The face guard slips directly into two ports built into the helmet. A thermoplastic rubber energy wedge holds the cage in place. At impact, the face guard compresses into the wedge, dampening the force of the hit by as much as 15%. Engineers at Shut create new helmet designs and a 3D modeling pad system. Noxie. The National Operating Committee on Standards for Athletic Equipment provides strict performance standards that the helmets must meet. New design concepts are analyzed in the impact test facility. In this hall of horrors, replicant human heads get some major headaches, so athletes don't have to.
the Noxy headworms are somewhat um, quasi-humanoid uh, to get the harmonics more like a, the human head. Inside the, the head form uh, is a cranial vault, a skull. Uh, this is filled with a glycerin material, uh, very close to the specific gravity of the brain matter. Um, and embedded in the center of gravity of the head form is the triaxial accelerometer that measures the g-forces. The standard Noxie drop test simulates a player impacting an immovable object at nearly 13 miles per hour. About like running head first into a brick wall. The computer records the severity index, or the number of g-forces the humanoid head form will experience at impact. This head form experienced 108 g's, Compare that to the same test inflicted on a vintage 1960s helmet, padded with old school suspension webbing. This head form experienced a whopping 218 Gs, more than double the trauma compared to the shut helmet. But the vast majority of helmet hits are not of the brick wall variety. Most will impact the brain from different angles and speeds. To simulate these hits, the linear impact test propels a 30 pound ram. In this test, it's uh, somewhat more real world. It has a three dummy neck uh, that's uh, fairly rigid, but you know, flexible. It also has a um, roller bearing table to where when it's struck that the body and the, and the head form move with the impact. A final integrity check serves up a helmet on ice. The cold crack test requires freezing a helmet to zero degrees Fahrenheit to make it brittle and then hitting it with a 20 pound projectile dropped four feet through a tube. If it doesn't crack now, it likely never will. We have many materials that we have an ongoing research of looking at better shock attenuation materials, better plastics that would be able to be used, looking for the best uh, combination of things. No one disputes that a brain injury is a serious event. But when you leap off a bridge over the Snake River Canyon, oh. Oh. A concussion doesn't compare to what could happen if you make the slightest mistake. It's a crystal clear day in Twin Falls, Idaho. Perfect conditions for a jump. Chris Wilson is a veteran skydiver. But today, there is no airplane. Today, he'll leap from the I.B. Perrine Bridge 485 feet above the Snake River Canyon. It's his first attempt at an extreme sport that many consider the most dangerous. I think when I climb over that railing, there might be a little bit of nervousness, but uh, as of now, I feel pretty confident and pretty good. Base jumping bears little resemblance to skydiving. Leaping off fixed positions so close to the earth presents a multitude of hazards. Unpredictable wind gusts, sheer rock faces, speeding by just feet away, and the precious few seconds to pull the chute mean any given jump could be your last. BASE is an acronym for Building Antenna Span Earth. To qualify for a recognized BASE membership, a person must successfully jump all four. There are an estimated 4,000 recognized BASE jumpers worldwide, with approximately 120 estimated deaths to date. The accident ratio in this sport is extreme. One in 33 jumpers will die. Unlike other jump locations, the Perrine Bridge is the only spot in the United States where base jumpers don't have to fear legal prosecution. But not without a courtesy call to the Twin Falls police. Yeah, we just have to call them because there's been a couple times when somebody driving across the bridge has seen someone jump, called in thinking they saw a suicide, and then 
they have to send out a car and see what's happening. Tom Aiello runs the Snake River Base Academy. He calls his four-day first-timers class Death Camp. Day one orientation requires each student to write a letter to relatives, explaining why he or she died base jumping. It makes the students sit and think about the reality of what they're doing. We're all connected to other people, and they're connected to their families and their friends, and they need to think about the impact on those people of the decisions they make. The American flag marks the landing zone. Land anywhere else, and the danger magnifies even more. See where the wooden footbridge is over that little gully? From there to the bridge is bad landing, OK? The gully itself is about six or eight feet deep. And on this side, there's a bunch of boulders hiding in those weeds, OK? So you don't want to try and land there. An early rehearsal helps to ease the tension. This is it, man. This is the moment I've been waiting for. But every jumper knows there is one X factor that could spell disaster, a parachute malfunction. The academy spends hours packing and repacking chutes. Unlike skydivers who carry a main and a reserve chute, base jumpers don't have the luxury of time in free fall to determine if their chute is faulty. For them, there is no time to deploy a reserve chute. They rely on one and only one parachute that's similar in size to a skydiving reserve canopy. This reality has helped darken the history of even a user-friendly jump site, like the Perrine Bridge. Six people have met their death, and several more have been injured jumping here. Most of the tragedies occurred when chutes failed to deploy. To prevent this, base jumpers typically release a small pilot chute that causes the main chute to deploy effectively. Oh, oh. you want to talk about that? Oh, man. Yeah, he, he fumbled the pilot chute. And then, because he had fumbled, he was kicking and threw himself in a line twist. The line twist happened because his body position got thrown off by missing. All right, let's do it. Right. To ensure this won't happen to him, Chris will perform what's known as a PCA, or pilot chute assist. I'm ready. Tom will hold on to the pilot chute and help deploy the main parachute as Chris falls. Ready, three, two, one, I'm out. Ah! Yeah! Woo! Chris's jump <sighs> looked really good, aside from at the very end, I think he should have turned around a little sooner. So, it was good. How'd that jump go? Describe oh, it. It was amazing. All right. Stand up landing, I'm all in one piece, so <laughs> rock on. Another day sets on death camp. The hope is that it will never live up to its name. The margin of error is so small, you really don't have time to fix any mistakes. So. Yeah, something, something happens and you don't react quick enough. See ya. Base jumping is dangerous. There's, there's nothing you can do to make it completely safe. And quite honestly, that's part of the appeal for some people. It's, it's facing a danger and overcoming it. Those who encounter the most dangerous come in all types. Some embrace the danger with a relentless passion. Others weigh the risks, but still play the game. While others wait in the shadows and silently pray they are spared. Watch, watch behind us, guys. None of us is immune to the danger. Our only say in the matter 